one, two, one, two. Am I clear or do I need to hear you good? Uh yep, you good. Okay. And now the camera's on you. Okay. Right now. So, ah, uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we are so back. Thank you for, for sticking around. I'm hoping y'all enjoyed the show thus far. You know, we had the actor Nakia Dillard on. We had Kevin Knox, the uh, 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 life life skills coach, and now we have uh, the most talked about, most requested, uh, handsome black man up ahead, Dr. Umar Johnson. So, yo, check us out, phillyhatradio.com. Phone lines are 484-477-6348. Chime in. But I thank you, uh, Dr. Umar, for coming back here. I appreciate you coming here. So the last time you were here, you were actually looking for a school. And now... Now we have the school. You have that. Delaware is the location. What? Uh, Yes, ma'am. Not too far from Philadelphia, which works well for me. Since I have a mother here in the city, so that allows me to still uh, look out for my mother and move forward with the process of renovating and opening the school. So we've successfully completed the first stage of this journey, and that's acquisition, purchasing the school. We own it outright. Wow. It is is a four-building campus. Uh, We have two schools, two gyms, and a fourth building. So it's four buildings all together. In Wilmington, Delaware, black neighborhood, black community. And wow. right now we're trying to raise about a million dollars to restore all four of the buildings. Uh, even if we don't hit the million mark, if we come close to it, we'll still have enough revenue to at least rehab one, two, or three of the buildings. The beauty of our situation is that all four buildings are one floor buildings. Okay. So, you know, the renovation and the restoration is a one level job. You don't have to worry about going upstairs or downstairs. Right. And that's the beauty of what we got. So we're asking people to mail in their donations, check a money orders payable to the FDMG Academy, P.O. Box 9634, Wilmington, Delaware, what? 19809. You can also cash app your donation to cash.me slash dollar sign FDMG school again cash dot me dollar sign slash excuse me cash dot me slash dollar sign FDMG school so folks can mail them in I picked up about 30 today thank you to all the brothers and sisters who have been donating uh, because they are the reasons that we finally after four and a half long years have been able to purchase this school and the beauty of our location is we are neighbors with the Boys and Girls Club of Wilmington, Delaware. Oh. And they have a nice size swimming pool. And they also have a very large park across the street. And we're looking to build a relationship with them. We want to support them and they want to support us as we improve opportunities for our young people. So overall, it's just a tremendous situation, a very great situation. Uh, With that being said, there was a school in Philadelphia that I was looking at just prior to the Delaware school. Right. And I just found out that the white realtor, young white boy, had actually uh, deceived me and told me that the Catholic school in question in North Philadelphia at 19th and Tioga was not available for sale. And I found out that it was available for sale. So he lied to me because he did not want to sell a school to a young black man. So I'm going to be speaking with an attorney to see if I have a case against him for intentionally misleading me against that school. However, with that being said, I'm still more than happy that the Lord took us to Delaware because the Delaware school Mm -hmm. is a much better school. It's a much better property than the North Philadelphia property that I would have purchased had the little white racist not deceived me into believing that the school was not available. So we're in the best place we could possibly be in. The school was more expensive than what we could afford, but through the grace of God and 18 months of negotiating with the owners, as of February the 7th, 2019, the school is ours. Wow, congratulations. I really thought it was going to be in Philadelphia. And I... uh, It would have been. (laughs) Yeah. But... The Delaware but school, the school. Is, is much better. Yeah, it's, it's much, much, better. much better. Much, it's modern. 
Uh, we do have to do a lot of renovations only because the security was not great. The okay. last owner really didn't secure the building the way that he should have. Right. So hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of damage was done yeah. just for a couple of people to get a couple of dollars worth of copper. They ripped sinks out. They ripped toilets out, brand new toilets. Wow. This was a state-of-the-art charter school. This was a state-of-the-art charter school, and it was largely uh, destroyed from within because of poor security. Uh, but we're going to get it back. We're going to get it back up. Uh, it's beautiful. I was there again today. Wow. And I just walked through the halls, and I marvel at what we got because we're going to make history, not just with our children, but I want the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy mm -hmm. to be the central right. organizing locations for black consciousness, black power, our black organizations. It's going to be an international centralized location for all Pan-African activity. So in addition to the school, it will house the National Independent Black Parent Association, which is something I hope we touch on briefly. It will also ha house Team Pan-African, which is my Pan-African organization that I started back in 2005, the International Movement for the Independence and Protection of African People. It would also house so many of the conferences that we want to see take place. The beauty of FDMG, the beauty is we have so much space. So we can have our International African Women's Conference. We can have our Young Pan-African Revolutionaries Conference. We can have our Ex-Offenders Conference. We can have our block parties. We can have our festivals. Everything we want to do, we can do in those four buildings. And then we have the whole street that is ours. So, you know, the cookouts are going to be crazy. Mm. The festivals are going to be crazy. Black Wall Street is going to be crazy. I want to do a monthly Black Wall Street where we rotate all the black businesses in America and across the world. And one Saturday or Sunday every month, mm -hmm. the entire gymnasium is filled with black businesses. All the classrooms are filled with black businesses giving seminars on their products, how to start your own business. The entire small gym is lined up with vendors and businesses. And then the small school, nothing but black businesses and entrepreneurs. So I want to do a once a month Black Wall Street where the entire black community can come to the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy and buy everything they need for the month. So we will basically be a on-site Walmart, a once a week black mark where all black businesses selling everything from toilet paper to cosmetics to computers to automobiles will all be centralized under the same roof once a month, and we're going to call it Black Wall Street. Black Wall Street. So the opportunities are endless. The opportunities are absolutely endless. We want to have a horse farm for the children. We want to have a regular farm, an animal farm. We're going to have a Marcus Garvey gun club. We're going to teach our young men how to fire firearms responsibly. There will be African martial arts. There will be trips to Africa. I mean, the, 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 the opportunities are limitless. So, again, I just thank God for getting me here because 2018 was a very, very rough year for me. And I'm just glad that 2019 came in with the success of us finally getting this school. And 2020 would be even better. 2020 will be even, be even better, better because better. we hope to open up. We want to open up the school on August the 21st of 2020, which will be the 100-year anniversary wow. of Marcus Garvey's first international convention mm -hmm. and the 100th anniversary of the red, black, and green flag. That's when we actually want to open the school. But, but we want to raise a million dollars by this August 21st okay. of 2019 because I want to have a week-long celebration for our ancestors, our quadricentennial, 400 years of black struggle against white oppression, 1619 to 2019. So if we can raise enough money to rehab these buildings over the next three, four months, then we want to have that celebration right on site. We want the whole black world to come to Wilmington, Delaware, and participate in the quadricentennial festivities of our ancestors. That's so interesting because um, I was born and raised here in Philly, North Philadelphia, Me born too. and Where raised, in born in Somerset, right? Asian between, <laughs> but I, I never, never, the young gentleman that was here um, uh, from Philly, West Philadelphia, and I had the uh, the actor, and he's from North Philly, but I've never attended a North Philadelphia school. Yeah. But I left Philly. I went to Chester. I left okay. Chester. I went to Delaware. Right I, in Delaware. Wilmington, Delaware. Well, actually, okay. I'm sorry. I, I stayed in Claymont. So okay. I was in the county. And then, uh, no, I'm sorry. I went to Wilmington, and then I wound up going to the county. Okay. So um, 
Claymont. So I was in Claymont, but my nonprofit is in Wilmington, Delaware. So I pretty much have connections with all of of whoever's who politically wise okay. in Wilmington. So when you say Wilmington, it's like wow. Oh, yeah. oh, <laughs> Wilmington yeah. is going to be very Ooh. excited. Oh, and going to be popping. It's going yeah. To be the of black America. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, it so is. yeah. Exactly what it's going to be. It's going and to they be their their school system. And I'm not putting anything away, taking anything away from the other schools, but Wilmington schools district really need some help. Mm -hmm. Like they really do. They need some um, someone to come in and change and revitalize some stuff. So congratulations, much love, much, I can't say wishing, but much success on this. I know Wilmington is going to be on you yeah. to further help you. I'm just hoping that the right people mm -hmm. touch you um, and not try to touch you and use you. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. So. And the beauty, as you know, of the location of Wilmington. Yeah is it's at the apex or the meeting site of Southern Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. Southern New Jersey, and then Northeastern Maryland. So what I like about that from a Pan-Africanist perspective is we will be able to serve boys from all four states. It's close enough for boys who live in Northeast Maryland mm -hmm. to attend. Mm -hmm. It's close enough for boys who live in Southeast Pennsylvania, near Chester, mm -hmm. or Caden. Okay, it's close enough for boys in southwestern New Jersey, your uh, your Camdens. Right, to come south. right so there. We will be able to serve boys from four different states. And then we also want to build a dorm. Of course, that's a three to five year project. But we want to build a dormitory for parents who would like to send their children to be a part of FDMG, but who can't afford to relocate to the area. And then we also want to build an online virtual school for African boys who live in other countries, other cities, and other gotcha. states, where they can tap into the classroom live and be in the class by way of computer. Mm -hmm. So we're the students, but we can see our classmates at home on the screen, and our classmates can see us. So they'll get the real school experience, right. literally. So virtual school versus a cyber school where you're being taught by a computer. With the virtual school, you're still being taught by a live living teacher. Now, what would be the difference between your school in the average Joe Blow school? Uh, what would be the difference between FDMG and the average school? The simple answer is everything. Uh, the complex answer is a lot of things. I'll just give you a couple. The goal of our school is not just to prepare black boys for college. Mm -hmm. Every school in Philadelphia, that's the only goal. If the child gets accepted, they consider it a success. Now, right. whether they finish or not, whether they end up with a job or not, whether they become a success story or not is irrelevant. They just want to be able to say all of our boys got accepted. That bar is too low for me because college is not automatically a recipe for success. We want to prepare our boys for life. And more particularly, we want to prepare them in the art of acquiring, defending, and protecting power and expanding power, economic, political, social, intellectual, spiritual, so forth and so on. So we are a school that will be focused on creating nation builders. A black God university is what FDMG will be. Um, our six key curriculums will be agricultural and agronomical science, dietary and nutritional science. We will also teach political and military science, science of the black man and black woman. We will also uh, teach uh, spiritual and astrological science, <laughs> in addition to those sciences that are required by the state. So obviously you have to teach math, science, social studies, and language. But on top of that, we will have the six nation building curriculums. So every child will learn at least two African languages. Uh, every child will go to Africa. Parents will be required to also take courses in parenting. They will get a lot of the same curriculum that the child gets because it doesn't make sense to teach the child without teaching the parent. Right. Uh, and also, for struggling children, they go to school seven days a week until they don't struggle anymore. So we have a solution for special education. Being a school psychologist, I know all too well how a lot of our children get away with uh, not doing their best by making their parents believe they have learning disabilities. 85% mm -hmm. of the children in special ed in Philadelphia do not have a learning disability. They have a lazy disability. <laughs> a big difference. There is a big difference. So I, would, yeah. I, I can't wait for them to try that at my school. Since you need extra help, 
We're going to give all the help you need on Saturday and Sunday. Ooh, yeah. I'm allergic to Sunday. <laughs> no, we've, we've talked about this before. Um, and uh, sorry for my tardiness. Um, no my name is Pat Edward. Good evening. Um, representative of just the community and many things. We met some time ago in okay. uh, in the church in the church in the basement off of Broad by Temple. This is the, okay. This is my first movie almost a decade ago, man. And okay. You were, I, I um, you know, people a lot of people have issue with you because you speak the truth, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it's it's not what you say; it's the approach. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, if you don't, ha there's really no time to be, you know, if you're unap unapologetically black. Like there's no way around that. You know what I'm yeah. It is what it is. Exactly. But no, to your point about boy, a lot of these young men, and you would know this better than me. Unfortunately, they're not, they're not being raised by men. Because mm -hmm. I was raised by a man. I mean, mm -hmm. I met your dad, mm -hmm. great man. You know, so I know you were raised by a man too. So our 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 understanding is a little different. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I appreciate everything that you just said. But I think a lot of these young people. Um, they're in their own way, but they mm -hmm. have a lot of people that are coddling them I that agree. are in the way as well. I agree. So I believe in the wraparound method. Mm -hmm. What 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 brought you to that? What led you to that? Um, well, to that dynamic or that thought? Well, when I first became an assistant principal mm -hmm. back in 05, mm -hmm. that's when I had an epiphany that maybe I could do more to save children mm -hmm. running a school than just being a psychologist. Gotcha. You know, because I said being a psychologist, even if you're a full-time therapist, you get 40 clinical hours a week. Okay. You work overtime, you get 60, right? Mm. But that's only 60 people you're touching. Okay. Whereas if you're the principal, you touch 600 every day. Yeah, that so makes sense. purely from a numbers perspective, I said, you know what? I may have to get into education. Uh -huh. You know, psychology is still my first love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, education and psychology go hand in hand. Okay. You know, so that's what led me into the principal field because I said uh, I can do more as a principal because on the principal side, you can prevent children. From struggling, you can prevent yeah. the delinquency. You can prevent the ADHD. Yeah. As a psychologist, you get them once they've already been labeled, they've already been marginalized, yeah. they've already been branded as a problem. So, from an intervention perspective, yeah. education beats psychology a hundred times over. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Sorry. You. Okay. Yeah. So, what you missed was that uh, he officially has a school in Wilmington, Delaware. I'm excited. <laughs> yes. You know, a lot of people was getting on him. I'm like, that was the first question I was going to ask. That, yes. That was the first question I was going to ask. I was thinking, I was rooting for Philadelphia, but it's still right over the bridge, so it's close. You know, but now, is it boarding school or is it? It's going to be residential initially. Okay. The long term goal is to be residential. Okay. It's going to be a day school, excuse me. But then we're going to evolve to residential campus. Okay. You know, when you go residential, you kind of need three, four, five times the money. Yeah, absolutely. Because the children are there 24 hours a day. So there's the possibility that the second school building, because we have two schools uh -huh. right across the street from each other, the second school could be a dorm. But I, um, I have a funny feeling I'm going to need all that space for classrooms. I expect us to grow exponentially because what we offer, nobody else is really giving. You know, so there won't be no out of school suspension because it doesn't make sense to send mm -hmm. kids home to single mothers who can't do anything with them in the first place. And many times the mother isn't there because she got to work two and three jobs. Yeah. So what is the easy. purpose of uh, sending them home? Yeah. Out of school suspension is actually a reward more than a punishment. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, so there will be no out of school suspension. You know, we will handle most of the academic remediation in house. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the subjects that they're going to be taught are totally. A non-traditional, you know, in terms of martial arts in school, a lot of children don't get that. Mm -hmm. You know, farming in school, a lot of children don't get that. Yeah, you know, aquaponics, the agriculture, the archery, the gun shooting. Are we going to have a Marcus Garvey gun club where they get their own gun and they will have to take care of their own gun? Wow. You know, and everything is in accordance, you know, with state law. It sounds like boot camp. You know, <laughs> oh, it will be a boot camp. It will be a black male boot camp mm -hmm. that prepares you for the rest of your life. No, I, mean, I, I, I spent. I went to the army. I mean, mm -hmm. I think the boot camp portion, you know, outside of the brainwashing, just being honest, mm -hmm. I think was a great experience because you learn camaraderie, you learn how to work with people you may not like yep. or agree mm -hmm. with, and also the discipline, right, to get up every day, get up early. I mean, mm -hmm. that's something I had because it was like my dad was something else, but I appreciate you, Pop, if you're listening. <laughs> um, hey, man, I can't talk about that name. Yeah. But no, nah, you, know, you know, Mr. Edward, I appreciate you. I really do. Um, but yeah, just that dynamic, man. So... Let me ask you a question. So me and a buddy of mine, this is a question from a buddy of mine who's actually a professor. He's a professor of mathematics. Mm -hmm. um, he's a brother for life. A brother, brother, you know, not mm -hmm. a brother that pretends to be a brother. Um, he had a question around what are the dynamics with um, 
the administration. Because with charter schools, mm-hmm. and I know you know this one. Yeah, I was a charter um, school person. Um, there's been a lot of, like, I don't want to say no names, but there's a few charter schools where there's administration with no men. Mm. Mm-hmm. Zero. Mm-hmm. And, there's, and there's no balance. Mm-hmm. Well, I agree with that. That you got to have males in your administration. But if I had to choose mm-hmm. between black males in my administration or black males in my classroom, I'm going to choose the okay. classroom. That's fair. Because if you go across the school district of Philadelphia, though most black males a significant portion of them are in administration, mm-hmm. but they're not in the classroom. Yeah, yeah. You see, and a lot of principals I've worked with in the school district of Philadelphia, they mm-hmm. basically stay in their offices. They're not the type that go around, visit classes, get to know the students. You only see them when you get in trouble. Yeah. You know, and that's not all their fault because big school districts that are predominantly black like Philadelphia, they use their black male principals as disciplinarians. So the average black male principal in Philadelphia was not hired for academic duty. They were hired to keep the Negro boys in line, mm. you know, which is kind of discriminatory in a way, too, because what happens is, let's it's say you want to be the principal boy. at Mastery or you want to be the principal at Central, you may never get that as a black male, even if you're qualified, because they'd rather put you at Strawberry Mansion or they're going to put you at Gratz. Mm. You understand? They'd rather yeah. put you at William Penn, which is no longer there, yeah. but they use the strong black males for disciplinary reasons. Even when I was the school psychologist with the school district. <laughs> they would always put me in the schools that the white women were afraid to go to, the white school psychologists. Mm. You know, and they would pull me from a school that I had built a relationship with. One time we had a German immigrant, a white German female school psychologist, and they pulled me from the school that I had built a relationship with and gave her the school. And they told me out flat, out front, we're giving her that school because the other school is too dangerous for her to travel to. White privilege. You, you signed up for the job. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? It's like being drafted. Exactly. You signed but up because she was a white woman, yeah. they put her in the schools they thought were the safest. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So, we have open to talk about everything and anything, not everything, but uh, we can talk about our black youth and uh, this R. Kelly stuff, or because oh, here. I Cardi B and not to take away Cardi had B is not came a uh, black no she's not but okay. she came out with <laughs> she had drugged uh, she came out and said this was an old video apparently this was an old video that resurfaced that she had drugged and stolen once you know they were asleep she had stolen money from so social media had started dragging her so and her defense was that. I was poor, I was young, um, I did what I had to do to survive. And I'm like, okay, at that time, there was no Cardi B and. So you didn't have to support anybody. There was not like you had a mouth to feed, so why are you drugging? Her response was, these were the people that she dated and they knew. I don't honestly believe that some guy would allow you to drug him to get the money in lieu of R. Kelly, and then you got uh, all these other black people who are now in jail, and then you come up with this one that apparently resurfaced, now she's defending. So, you know, but I know Cardi B doesn't, she does, she's not a great representation, but I threw that out there because you got R. Kelly, and I get that part, R. Kelly was doing stuff for years. You know, you got Bill Cosby who allegedly claimed that he drugged somebody, and then here's Cardi B, and she still, being idolized, and I don't. I have an issue with people idolizing people like her after they said, "Hey, this is what I've done," and then you got Bill Cosby sitting up in jail. Um, well, unfortunately, yeah, I want him when he got yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Cardi B situation. She's symbolic of the mentality of Black America. Uh, mm. She's being dragged, but not being dismissed because we celebrate negativity. I mean, she's a living reality show. Her life is a living reality show. So Mm. Cardi B will always be relevant because she is so sensationalized and her content is so negative and so conflictual. It's why the reality shows are popular because they're based on negativity. Every single show is conflict. And that's where black America is now. You go down your Facebook uh, feed, your Twitter feed, your Instagram feed, you go on YouTube, 85% of the content is based on gossip, sensationalism, and negativity. You know, the black media, for me, has fallen from grace. Because I remember once upon a time, the black media's job was to have serious, you know, conversations like we're doing now. (laughs) That's no longer the job of the black media. The black media used to be an institution that advocated change. 
It investigated. It brought information to black people that was being hidden. It exposed racism. It took up serious issues. Mass incarceration, police genocide, unemployment, the wealth gap. Look at black media now. It chases celebrity gossip. Mm. It chases professional sports. Mm. It chases who won the lottery, who got robbed at the gas station. Not to say that that's not relevant, but what about the systematic issues that impact black life? What happened to black media's responsibility to educate and advocate? I see very little education from the black media, very little advocacy. Even if I pick up the jet, I pick up you know, Ebony, even some of our more respectable black publications, mm-hmm. a lot of it is filled with satire, media gossip, and celebrity chasing. Very few strong, qualitative articles are being written now. Yeah. Everybody's just after sensationalism, and it's a shame mm-hmm. because we are probably in the worst state we've been in since the Jim Crow era. The only thing worse than this is slavery. The only thing worse than this is slavery, you know, and everybody will jump on Trump, but you got to jump on Barack Obama too, because Barack Obama created the context that allowed the black conversation to be removed from the table. Mm-hmm. Barack Obama is the first president in American history who black people didn't ask to do a single thing for them. Mm-hmm. He made history that way. And so when people say, well, Donald Trump has brought forth this new wave of white hate against black people. No, Barack Obama triggered the new wave of white hate against black people because white people knew he would do absolutely nothing and say absolutely nothing in defense of black people while he fervently articulated the agendas of homosexuals. He fervently articulated the agenda of women and he fervently articulated the agenda of immigrants. He gave the homosexuals three laws. Women got two laws, immigrants got three laws, black people didn't get a single law, even though police genocide had came back in a way we hadn't seen since the 60s. Mm-hmm. So this is not all about Trump. We don't want to be honest about these conversations. This began with Obama. Trump, Obama put you to sleep, and Trump was the alarm clock that woke you up. Mm. Do you think that part of it was because of his affiliation with like Goldman Sachs? You know, I mean, I think they had a lot to do with it. Yeah. But a lot of that is on the economic side. Every president is given some latitude to affect some domestic change. Mm-hmm. You know, so for example, Barack Obama put out the Brothers Keeper Initiative, yeah, MBK, yeah. which was something that he did, mm-hmm. you know, to try to look like he was doing something to address I mean, the there was no money black males. There. there was no money put in that. Not yeah. only that, it didn't address any of the major issues affecting yeah. black males. Yeah. Employment yeah. wasn't dealt with at all. Yeah. A lot of it was mentorship, role modeling. Uh-uh. Mm. There's nothing wrong with that. But we need economic opportunity. The number one problem affecting black men after police genocide Mm. and black-on-black fratricide is economic opportunity. Mm. Much of the black-on-black crime that we see is the outgrowth of a pain Mm. that grows from the fact that I'm not able to fulfill my obligations as a husband and a father and a man. The job of a man is to protect and provide. I can probably protect, but I'm having a big time providing. We're the only males in America who are out-educated and out-earned by our women. The only men who are out-earned and out-educated. We just talked about that this morning. And that's why crime is so rampant because when when the only way you can prove your manhood is to hurt another person, there's going to be crime. Yeah. See, the white males can sit around and talk about their stocks and their businesses and their multinational corporations, and that's how they prove their masculinity. That's how they validate themselves yeah. based on what I own. Yeah. You understand? Chinese, what I can control. European Jews, what I can make. Yeah. Black men, who I can kill. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think part of that is linked to um, trauma? Absolutely. Yeah. Post traumatic slavery disease. Yeah. We went mm. through 240 something years of the greatest human disaster and crime in my, in history. Mm. And after we got out of it in December of 1865 with the 13th Amendment, there was no period of healing. Yeah. We went straight from the trauma. I feel like you did tap into my brain. Right <laughs> no, seriously, we're, we're, the, we're the only culture, doesn't matter if you're Caribbean, doesn't matter if you're African, doesn't matter if you're African American, mm-hmm. we're the only culture that hasn't got a chance to heal yes. and reconstruct with fervor mm-hmm. and fidelity, right? Mm-hmm. Because there's always been some interference. Like just mm-hmm. here in um, Philadelphia, Society Hill, mm-hmm. Old City, used to be all black. Yes. South Street used to be all black. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But once they realized the value, because remember, they used to dump their trash yep. and throw their waste down down yep. there. So what happened was, oh, wait a minute. This is the same thing like Tulsa. That was the first uh, air attack in U.S. history. Yeah. Everybody thinks it was here in, in, in Philadelphia, which mm-hmm. that was messed up too. But like it, the first one was in Little mm-hmm. Africa. 
Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, a lot of this is our responsibility, too. Yeah, agree. As a people. Of those of us that are awake, though. Yes. Everybody no, not, everybody not awake. awake. Everybody no. Not, but even amongst the woke folks. Yeah. But woke did you Many broke, of though. them are irrelevant, too, because they don't have any courage or commitment. Okay. See, just being woke means nothing. Okay. You know, Henry Louis Gates is woke, but there's no courage to mm. challenge the system, and mm. there's no commitment to make things better for your people. Mm. You know, I respect Michael Eric Dyson. I respect Cornell West. I respect them. They're woke. Mm. But where's the courage and the commitment? I mean, what they, are you changing? They're getting them Ivy League checks. It's different. Exactly. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, no, mm. no shade. Yeah. I, I'm just saying, yeah. like, I, I'm not in that position. So I don't right. know I don't know how I would behave. Right. Right? right. If Harvard or Yale was cutting me a check, mm-hmm. I don't know how I'd behave. I can't say. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But everybody has a price. You know everybody has a price. Yeah. Wow. Most people have that. a price. Most. Everybody shouldn't have a price. And of I course, agree. those who didn't have a price, they end up dead. Malcolm, Meg, or Martin. Yeah. Or, or hungry. Or hungry. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But see, you speak to a issue mm-hmm. that black people don't like to discuss, and that's sacrifice. Yeah, but Everything we got, we had to sacrifice for it. Mm-hmm. Now, the new black leadership has miseducated the youth, and most people don't have a political understanding of our history into believing mm-hmm. that voting is the solution to black America's problems. Now, I was a political science major undergrad. Mm-hmm. You can't name one thing black people got through a vote. Everything we got, we got through armed street protests, struggle, everything. We got out of slavery, we fought. We got out of Jim Crow, we fought. We got the Civil Rights Bill because we fought. We got the Voting Rights Act because we fought. Mm. Everything we got, we fought for it. There's not one major thing you can name that black people got with a vote. Mm. Hmm. And, and, and because voting is, is, is a mechanism put in place mm-hmm. to make poor people think they actually have a way to control rich people. Mm. Voting is something, democracy in and of itself, is a deception Mm -hmm. because it makes people who are powerless think Mm -hmm. that there's a way to take power from the powerful without armed conflict. Mm -hmm. You can't name a society in human history where power was taken by anything other than blood. And I'm not advocating open violence, Mm -hmm. okay, especially not in our predicament because number one, we love white folks and hate each other, so we'll end up killing (laughs) each other first. So we have to keep that in mind. Black people are absolutely infatuated with white folks, Mm -hmm. and we need to get over that. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's why you can't really solve our issues because whenever you talk about issues, half of the community wants to come to the defense of white people because we were conditioned to do that since slavery. They are our gods, Mm -hmm. not Jesus, but the white man. Yeah. And that's why we don't have a problem painting Jesus white because it makes so much sense. After all, my personal deity is white. Why shouldn't Jesus be? And so for me, from a psychological standpoint, that white Jesus is a very big problem. Mm-hmm. But it's ironic, though, that we'll worship a man who sacrificed everything. But we don't want to sacrifice anything. Mm-hmm. You worship a man who sacrificed everything, mm-hmm. but you don't want to sacrifice anything. Black people are a $2 trillion community. $2 trillion. The richest group of Africans on the globe. Hmm. Our GNP is more than any other African group in the world. Yeah, but we're rich in things, not in exactly. real economic stuff. Exactly. Well, there is no collectivism yeah. because we are a race and a nation of individuals. We're the only people without any cultural glue yeah. that holds us together. Uh-huh. That's why the Chinese can come and outwork you, do more in five years than we've done in 500 that's why the Arabs, the Mexicans, they can come and outwork you in five years mm. more than you've done yourself in 500, notwithstanding all of those systematic barriers that have been put in place. So, yes, there's racism there, mm. but put the racism to the side. Mm. We should still be much further along. Yeah. Let's take education. Yeah. For example, everybody agrees that the school to prison pipeline is an issue. Everybody agrees that special ed and ADHD and psychiatric meds is an issue. Yeah. Everybody mm. agrees that the inner city schools are failing. Okay, then. The United States government gives you the prerogative to build your own schools. You are allowed to have your own schools. So with $2 trillion, spending $2 billion a year on Air Jordan, $4 billion a year on alcohol, over $16 billion a year on weed, perm, and hair care, spending, purchasing twice the amount of Mercedes Benz's as white folks. Black people buy twice the Benz's of white people, but you have less than a third of their wealth. Where are the schools? Where are the supermarkets? Where are the hospitals and where are the banks? Where are the Those are the four <laughs> critical institutions. Man. You can find them. There's a little Italy in many states across the country. You'll find a little Italy. Mm-hmm. You'll find a little China. A little. You'll find a little Israel. You've never found a little Africa. Mm. 
And why is that? Because the one thing slavery did, one of the major psychological residuals of slavery is it made us comfortable not having any control, any power, any authority over our destiny. Remember, as a slave, you had no control over your destiny. Yeah. If the slave master wanted to sell you, he could. Yeah. If you wanted to rape your wife, he could. Yeah. You had no control over your immediate destiny. And we have been so conditioned yeah. into not having no control yeah. that we don't want no control. The reason why black America is not an independent nation is because we don't want the responsibilities that come with independence. Yeah. Do you think it's fear of success? I think it's fear of the white man. It's fair to white men. Black people don't want to lose their, their relationships with white folks. So take mm. our celebrity class. Take it over Winfrey, right? Yeah. Mm. Oprah don't need any more money. So she said, so she doesn't have a fear that the white man will take yeah. or stop me from making more. Yeah, but she's still broke in comparison to like Bill Gates. Oh, she absolutely is. Like but she's comfortable <laughs> enough to live her life. Yeah, right? she's comfortable. The point is, though, Facts, yeah. she doesn't want to lose the comfortability. Yeah. The comfortability of being able to come and go yeah, in the it. upper echelon of white society. You yeah. follow me? So there's nothing financial that she fears. Yeah. She fears losing the positive attitude that white people have about her. Yeah. Almost like the, um, you know, when you move to a place where you're the only, <laughs> you know, you're the only chip in the cookie. Exactly. Yeah. And you grow accustomed to a certain lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of the reason that Bill Cosby got caught up because Bill Cosby. I, I believe as intelligent as he is, and I had the opportunity to hear him speak live, it was a very brilliant speech. Mm -hmm. I believe Bill Cosby began to think that because he had made it to a certain social economic level, that white supremacy would somehow treat him differently. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest lessons as a people we have yet to learn is white supremacy does not put black people in categories. It likes to make you think you're in a different category. Mm -hmm. For example, in the Haitian Revolution, Napoleon told Very familiar. the whites in Haiti during the revolution, he said, treat the mulattoes, the mixed race Africans, treat them better. Make them think you view them as differently than the unmixed blacks. But in your own self, know that they are no different. This is only a strategy that we're using to sow discord, mistrust, and jealousy amongst the two groups. They did it all in Africa. They do it in black America with the light skin, dark skin, educated, non-educated. Yeah. The white man doesn't see Barack Obama any differently than me. He don't see Oprah Winfrey no differently than her, but they will treat them differently to give a false sense of security under the white reality until they no longer need you. Bill Cosby would not be in jail if they still had a reason to exploit his talents for the American economic order. Yeah. O.J. Simpson would have never went to jail if he was still relevant economically. Why do we see LeBron James being under attack somewhat now with the Lakers not making the playoffs? It ain't because the Lakers didn't make the playoffs. It's because LeBron James has that HBO show, that barbershop show, where he talks about some serious issues, including race. And so he's showing the world that I know I'm black. And you're doing this in L.A.? They don't like that out there. Yeah. That's why LeBron James is under attack. Yeah. When you are no longer a school economic well. reality, yeah. they will toss you back to the same ghetto you came from. Mm. Mm. Man, Akron is a rough place. I, I spent a lot of time. I had a, a, a good friend that went to University of Akron, um, friend of Dia. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if you ever rode rode through Akron. Oh, I've been so through it's, Akron. but it's worse than Cleveland. Yeah, you know. Um, so I think. Yeah. By him building the school, man, that shows social responsibility. Well, he didn't build a school. Okay. It's a, the school is a public school. It's okay. an Akron public school. Okay. But what LeBron is doing, which I support and appreciate, Absolutely. he's providing incentives yeah. for the children who attend the school and their parents. Yeah, so he's going to pay for them to go well. to college, yeah. and he's going to pay for the parents to go to college. But it's an Akron public school. Yeah. He did not build a school. And okay. to that point, okay. mm. and I'm a big supporter of LeBron because I believe he's been more vocal on political issues affecting black people yeah. than either Kobe or Mike put together. Mm. So from that perspective, he is the GOAT. Because Michael Jordan never spoke up in defense of black people, nor did Kobe Bryant. At least LeBron. Well, well you know, that. you know why he ain't speak up. Yeah. You know. Cause yeah. He, yeah. You know why he didn't speak up. But with, no, with, he, without question. Yeah. Without question. But my issue with yeah. LeBron, yeah. Sean Puffy Combs, mm. Jalen Rose, and others is you guys are millionaires. Mm. Why are you opening up charter schools? Mm. The question was why does a millionaire need a welfare check? A charter school to a millionaire is a welfare check. It's a public school. You don't control it. The state runs it. You understand? Yeah. You are giving some freedom to uh, 
modify the learning process. Yeah. But a charter school, at the end of the day, yeah. is state property. Yeah, you don't have full control. Yeah. Why would you not start the Sean Puffy Combs, you know, Academy for Art or whatever? At least you own it. Yeah. Put it in a trust. It's yours forever. But these celebrities open up charter schools to me. And I don't want to be too critical of them. It sends a message that you're not really serious yeah. about the undertaking because you're not risking your money. Do you think they understand? I think they understand to some degree. I think they know that they don't own this. Like if you look at the so-called LeBron James school, right? And I only say so-called because it's a public school, not his. Yeah. It's mostly white women teaching in it. Why is it not mostly black men? Because it's a public school. <laughs> if it was a bronze school, I'm sure LeBron would have put all black males in there. But you got mostly white women in that school. Wow. So how, how, how is that going to be any different than any of the other schools? Because everyone knows that the major issue affecting the black boy trying to get an education is the white racist female teacher, which never gets discussed. When you read these articles about the school district and how kids are struggling and the test scores are low and they don't know how to sit still, nobody's talking about why. That white woman in that classroom is there to pay her bills. She is not there because of those children. Most of them are there because they couldn't get a job in the suburbs, they're on the waiting list, or they got that Obama loan forgiveness program where you spend five years in the ghetto and they pay off all your student loans. And that's why the good white teachers, if you pay attention to it, after five years, they always disappear. You say, what happened to Mrs. Slurvinowski and Mrs. Uh, Sandusky and uh, Sandusky. Dr. Silverberg. Get out of pocket. Burn that <laughs> one. <laughs> I say, what happened to that good white English teacher, that good white math yeah. teacher? She was only here for five years because she was only here to get her loans paid. Yeah. She didn't care about them kids. Yeah, she wow. didn't. And, and let, me, uh, let me make this announcement because I think it's relevant. Sure. In Delaware, in Wilmington, where the school is, sure. mm -hmm. uh, we're going to be hosting the National Independent Black Parent Association mm -hmm. Advocacy and Parent Training Course. So any black person, you, have, you don't have to be a parent, any black person in America who wants to get trained by me, mm -hmm. school law, special ed procedure, mm -hmm. discipline process, how to write letters, how to deal with the school, everything from ADHD to learning disability to autism to vaccinations to immunizations to report cards to reading standardized test scores, I'm going to teach them everything from A to Z that they need to know to be an effective advocate for their child. When is this class? This is June 8th and 9th, 8th Saturday 8th. and Sunday, okay. June 8th and 9th in Wilmington, Delaware, from 9 to 5. Nine Anyone to five. can register at my website, drumarjohnson.com, D-R-U-M-A-R-Johnson.com. Hmm. And we're going to go through everything. Wow. After you come out of those two days, there's nothing the school can throw at you that you won't be able to deal with. You will be taught that if you don't agree with the psychological evaluation, you have a federal right to an independent educational evaluation. Most parents don't know this. So when they come back and say your child has a reading disability, if you don't agree, mm -hmm. you have a right to a second opinion, and the school district pays for the second opinion. Yeah, is that some of the stuff that fell under the uh, No Child Left Behind Act? Nah, this is, this no. is separate. No Child Left Behind is a federal law mm -hmm. that encompasses special ed, but does not regulate special ed. Special mm -hmm. ed is its own separate federal law, gotcha. which is known as the Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act mm -hmm. of 2004. It was last revised mm -hmm. by former President George W. Bush. I'm assuming it may be revised again under Donald Trump or maybe the next president. But special ed law, it's a very thick law. Because yeah. you got to remember, you got 13 disabilities. You got deaf, blind, autism. Mm -hmm. Most presidents don't really want to deal with it if they can. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because that was 04, and this is now 19, so it's been 15 years mm -hmm. without a revision. And that's because special ed is real political, and it's very technical. So, for example, mental giftedness. We remember the MG kids? Mm -hmm. Mental giftedness used to be a part of special ed. It was taken out back in 2000 to 2004. Hmm. They, they took it out. And one of the reasons they took it out is to defund it. See, special ed is a business. So I'm a school psychologist, yeah. right? There's no, can't, there's, no, um, there's no money in the cure. Oh, there's no money in the cure. Yeah. Money in the problem. Yeah. So let's say I evaluate your son, reading disability, right? Mm -hmm. His name goes into a computer. Mm -hmm. He gets transferred to Harrisburg, State Department of Education. Mm -hmm. And by the end of the month, there's an electronic transfer of funds mm -hmm. yep. to the school. Special ed is a hustle. Yeah. Special ed is a right. These black boys in West Philly are not sitting in special ed to get help. They are sitting in special ed so the school can exploit the fact that they didn't teach them mm -hmm. into a welfare check by the end of the month. Yeah, Special ed is the biggest racket in America. Yeah, it's an extra, I think, because I know the, pu the per pupil allocation in Philadelphia, I believe, is 14 five. 
Right. And so then special I, ed kids almost thirty. Yeah, yeah, it's like fifty. That's that's crazy. It's so the money, fun. so the money you doubles. Tw- yes. So you're almost getting the money that you be getting out in Lower Marion. Yes. That's deep. Exactly. Because I think Lower Marion is twenty six. Yeah. And that's why they don't like. And speaking of Lower Marion, yeah. I was part of a class action lawsuit out there yeah. where I evaluated some children at Lower Marion High School. Yeah. Kobe Bryant went, and mm. we had a situation out there where those white folks was putting black kids in special ed who had A's and B's. Damn like, I'm evaluating this kid. Like, wait a minute. Her report <laughs> Everybody. Is A's and B's. Yeah. Her test scores is 85th percentile. Yeah. What is she doing in special ed? And the white folks would say, well, she was struggling. You cannot put a child in special ed Just unless way. there is clear evidence yeah, that yeah. they have trouble learning that skill yeah. in the regular class, which speaks to another issue. Yeah. A lot of black parents think that they're doing their child a favor by, by taking them out, them out of the ghetto Thank you so much. and putting them in the suburbs. Yeah. Guess what? They're more likely to be special educated in the suburbs. Yeah. They're more likely to be put on psychiatric meds in the suburbs because guess what? Number one, the suburb schools never wanted those black kids. How dare you move yeah. out here? Ask so him High School. Can, you follow Ask him yeah. High School. You, you yeah. see what's going on there. Yeah. You know, it's a it's a hot mess, and I think it's um it's very sad. I mean, I mean, she knows this. So I, I raised uh, three of my, one of my siblings' kids, okay. right? And they went to public school. You know, they went to um, Anna Lingelbach. You know, I think I think they do a good job. They do what they can, mm-hmm. right? But a lot of the, the old regime is there, the ones that care about kids. But when they came home every Wednesday, what, Wednesdays and Thursdays, it was, you know, time with your uncle, mm-hmm. eyes on the prize, That's right. hidden colors, which you're in, right. um, sh- shameless <laughs> plug, and um, just whatever I can get my hands on, yeah. right, that was interactive, right, yeah. during the summers, when you got home from tennis camp and golf camp, not basketball and football camp, right? Because we have to no elevate. More today. We got to elevate them. Yeah. Um, they had to write essays. Yes. Right. You had to write an essay. You yes. had to proofread your essay, and then you had to type in and email it to me. See what I'm saying? Absolutely. We got to. Tr- so I get a lot of your philosophy. It makes mm-hmm. sense, but like, mm-hmm. if you're emotional about it, you're not going to catch the, 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 the message. The problem yeah. that some black parents have with my philosophy mm-hmm. is it doesn't allow them to blame the schools or the kids. Mm. The problem that the white teachers have with my philosophy is it clearly places a large part of the burden on their racist attitudes toward their children. Black educators have a problem with my philosophy because they don't like the fact that I say that just because you're preparing kids for college, that's not enough. Because it's not enough. Yeah, they need it's more, not, they they need more than more college. Than not, you need to first of all, hands. you know why they started redirecting black children to college? It was part of the whole deindustrialization of the inner city. In the 1970s, when they started taking the factories out of Philadelphia and started taking all of the industrial building trade programs out of Dobbins and out of all these high schools, because remember, up until 1970, the education was not college prep. It was industrial. It was plumbing. It was architecture. It was cosmology. It was the auto mechanic. It was welding. It was woodworking. It was practical skills so you could pay your bills. Yeah, basic computer stuff. You can leave. They said at one point you can leave Dobbins or Bach and get a job like a week later. License. You walk out with license. You took your state board before you graduated. That's crazy. Right? Not no more. Not no more. Now everybody goes to college. You want to know why? Because a, a college degree does not automatically equal any type of employment because the knowledge is intellectual. It's not practical. If you go to a trade school, right? You certified plumber, carpenter, you know how to do something with your hands. You can literally create something with your hands, a tangible product that you can sell to somebody. I can fix your car, I can fix your roof, I can fix your toilet, and you can pay me. You can exchange skill, right? Yeah. For money. For money. But when you get a college degree, you have a bachelor's in sociology, you have a bachelor's in political science, you have a bachelor's in history, four years. Eighty thousand dollars in student loan debt. How can you exchange mm. that knowledge on the street legally to pay a bill? Yeah, Who do you see walking down the street? Anybody need any <laughs> sociology information? Anybody need any psychology information? Anybody need any uh, archaeology information? Think about it. Anthropology. Yeah, anthropology. You cannot anthropology, exchange yeah. that information for a paycheck nowhere. Listen, Doc, I'm no about way. to sell this anthropology here. <laughs> You, you <laughs> see, so then you go back to college to get your master's, yeah. and then you find out that you're still not yet well qualified. And if no. you don't have any social capital, exactly. you can't get in the room. Yeah. Exactly. So you got a lot of people yeah. who go in this circle, yeah. three, four, five degrees, yeah. 
only to find out yeah. that they were never going to hire you anyway. Anyway. Look at the black middle class. Do you know why we even have a black middle class? Really, we don't have one. But the reason why you have an artificial one is because the government hires black people to give the illusion of upward mobility. Most black middle class people are public employees, post office, bus driver, mm -hmm. school teacher, city government, police. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. Because downtown white business, they're not hiring you. It's the government that hires college educated blacks to give the illusion of a black middle class. If the, if the government said we can't afford to hire any more black people in our public sector jobs, teachers, cops, firemen, civil service jobs, a traffic ticket givers, security at the airport. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. If they decided that they wasn't hiring any more of those service jobs, black people would be hungry. There would be no black middle class. Mm. And it's a misnomer anyway because class speaks to what? Ownership of wealth. What do black people own? Which is why they redefine two, class. Two class is no longer, <laughs> do you know the new definition of class? Class no longer includes your ownership of wealth. Right, but wealth class but, uh, now is education and yeah. occupation. Yeah, it is not income. Yeah, but wealth is not built in. First of all, well, to it's your point, it's intergenerational. Yeah, you can't build wealth in one generation. And exactly. I have this argument with folks that look like us all the time, mm. and like, well, you know, I'm trying to get wealthy. Wealth is health. You know, hashtag. You know, you mm. know especially you know millennial folks. You know, people try, try, try to couple me into that, but I was born before '85. I ain't no damn. Money. <laughs> anyway, um, so it's really. Interesting the dynamics behind that when you have that conversation with people, particularly if you know they started creating the wealth now, but you're not wealthy, you're rich, right? Exactly, you're rich, you're not wealthy. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a huge exactly. difference. difference. Rich people yeah. can difference. only do one thing with their money spend it. Yeah, wealthy people are people who earn income off of their assets without having to work. Wealth gives you unearned income. Riches, yeah. you can only exchange that for a product or a service. Yeah. That's it. Right? Or, or Benz. So you see these, these goofy-ass huh. rappers with 25 cars. Automobiles depreciate with value. As soon as you, drop so as you, you take 25, it off the lot. $100,000 cars, yeah. in five years, they'll be worth almost nothing anymore. Yeah. You see? But because we're so caught up in the bling-bling culture, mm -hmm. we love to invest in things that have no return on them. Yeah. The chains, the clothes. The, think about it. The stuff that black people, the pocketbooks, $2,500 for a Louis Vuitton bag? Do you know they burn their, so I found this out like two months ago. So they burn every year when they're done with that line or whatever. They burn, they burn they their bur pockets. They burn them. Yeah. That, they don't, like no factory yeah. store or nothing. Yeah. Just, when just they burn it. to keep the value up, because you know, the less you have in circulation, the, the, the more the expensive it is. Yeah. And it's sad because when I go to Africa, because we are the leaders, we are the, uh, what do you want to call this? We are the fad leaders of the entire race. We're the co I don't want to call it culture. What do you want to popular culture leaders? Mm -hmm. Every black person in the world is looking at black America to decide what's hot and what's mm -hmm. not. Yeah, that's literally. Not, that's right. Literally. Yeah. They sad. emulate the way you wear your hair, they emulate the way you dress, your music, the whole nine. Yeah. So when we don't get our act together, we're not only affecting us. We're affecting the whole race. Yeah, we are. Up. Black kids in Jamaica want to do what you're doing. Yeah. Black kids in South Africa want to do what you're doing. So everybody watches us. Yeah. And they create their culture based off of what we're doing. And we don't even know what the hell we're doing. So imagine we, they we don't. don't. It's the blind following the blind. And it's the, sad. The blinder. <laughs> but it's Guess sad. What? Uh. A part of this yeah. sickness that we got grew out of the fact uh. that the hip-hop industry created a whole bunch of overnight millionaires, mm -hmm. which upset the natural age differential and respect ladder in the black community. Mm -hmm. So from an African culture, the elders get the most respect. Yeah. They dictate the policy, right? Yeah. You don't see that no more in the black community. Why? Because in traditional times, the elders controlled the wealth. They decided who got the land, who got the cattle, who got married to whose granddaughter. But with the rise of hip hop, the young African American millionaire who might not be rich but at least acts like it, guess what? <laughs> when the youth became the income generators, the respect paid to the elders dropped off. Mm -hmm. So now Little Wayne's opinion is more important than a 100 year old African American elder mm -hmm. because Little Wayne makes more money than she does. 
And because we live in a society that values money over culture and respect and honor, wow. the rappers are the de facto black bourgeoisie now. Because mm. guess what? For the first time, we don't have black leaders. Do you realize? We don't. Do you realize? We, we don't. That this is the first time in African-American history you are without an identified leader. And guess what made Jesse and Al and the Congressional Black Caucus and the NAACP and the Urban League irrelevant? Police genocide. When the black youth saw how they responded to Freddie Gray, and when the black youth saw how they responded to Michael Brown, Tamir mm -hmm. Rice, the black youth saw We've seen that it. these guys ain't real. They have no solution for genocide. You can't vote away police genocide. You can't march it away. So that automatically exercises a lot of them away from that platform of being a leader. Mm -hmm. So right now, you don't have a single identified leader. That could be a good thing mm -hmm. because it means you automatically have to force up a whole new breed. Mm -hmm. That the dictatorship that Al Sharpton and Jesse Jackson and even Minister Farrakhan to some extent had over black leadership yeah. has now faltered. And so now there's an opening for a new leadership. But white supremacy doesn't leave anything to chance. So guess what they're doing? They're filling the leadership vacuum with celebrities and entertainers. Yeah, sure enough are. Have you noticed we're the only people whose rappers and actors and basketball players are the actual spokespersons? I love D.L. Hughley. You understand? And I believe the brother is conscious and progressive. Absolutely. But he can't be no spokesperson for black folks. You're an entertainer. You understand? Right. And the reason why, and why does an entertainer not make a good spokesperson? Because when you're an entertainer, you're in something called show business. Yeah. You depend as much on white people as you depend on black people to do what? Attend your shows? Mm -hmm. Do you know most rap is bought by white kids? Of course. You see that? Mm -hmm. So how can a rapper be our spokesperson when if you say the wrong thing, they, they might not buy another not. one of your albums? So there's a significant conflict of interest. But because we have no leaders, the athletes are now the new leaders yeah. and the rappers are the new spokespersons. So I... I agree with you. Like it's fifty fifty for me. I do think there's leaders out here. I just I don't say it again. Well, wait, wait, what? No, I'm not speaking on the community based level. Okay, I'm speaking on okay. the national black leaders. Oh yeah, I agree with you there. Yeah, we don't right. have any. But we, let's we go to the community based level. Sure. You have a lot of community based level, but for me, coming from a Marcus Garvey perspective, total independence. Yeah. You cannot qualify as a leader if you're being financed by the government or white philanthropy. Yep. Mm. So for example, if Welcome you meet somebody mm. in the community in Philadelphia who's doing some good. Mm. I can respect them as an agent of change, okay. but I cannot respect them as a leader mm -hmm. because one of my qualifications for leadership is economic independence. Mm -hmm. So if you have a stop the violence program, doing good things, I will salute you mm -hmm. as an agent of change. You cannot be my leader because your bread and butter comes from white people. Mm -hmm. And that is a significant conflict of interest. Because mm -hmm. you can only say but so much and do but so much. Because a, a black man or black woman who is financed by the power structure claims to be a leader is a leader waiting to be corrupted or co-opted. There's no way you can stay true when you're being paid by them. Yeah, if you're... Because if you're, you're, yeah. what's the first thing they go after? Your, your livelihood. Yep. Yep. That's the first... No, which I is why all great leaders had to be what? Independent. Malcolm was independent. King was independent. Yeah. Megger was independent. There's no way in hell you're going to have to be the manager at Walmart and you out here taking on police genocide. Yeah. It's just not going to work. <laughs> Which, when you go back to entrepreneurship, yeah. that makes entrepreneurship a revolutionary necessity. Yeah. It's not even an option. It's a necessity. Yeah. The only reason why I can speak the way that I speak is because I'm independent. Yeah, nobody control you, I suffer yeah. because of it. Yeah. But guess what? The freedom of speech, yeah. I would never give it back. Mm. Because when I'm on these panels Powerful. with all these bourgeois college Negroes, they looking like he right, but I can't co-sign it. Yeah, that. I can't co-sign it. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, we had an issue like that the other night. Um, I like this brother, so I'm not going to put him on blast. But I was at a meeting uptown, right? And uh, this dude said that uh, gentrification had nothing to do with race. What? It's a big article. What? A big stink in the paper right. about that. Did he even know how ghettos were created? <laughs> I broke it. Up. I broke it down in front of him a little bit, but I I kept it. I kept it what real that? high level. What? Yeah, that's what he said. That's what yeah, he said. that's a big stink going on right now in yeah. Philadelphia, and they it's treading in the papers. Out, and it's yep. not local. It's national. Yeah. yeah. Harlem. Yes. Remember Bill Clinton after he got out of office, he moved into yeah. Harlem. Yeah. Oh, it's a, yeah. uh, uh, Clinton, Clinton Powell. Clinton Powell. Yeah. 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 To raise the property value and force the poor blacks out, they used Jay Z when they built the uh, Barclay Center. Yeah. To displace all those blacks. Yeah. But don't get me wrong. I don't think. At the time, he knew. He knew. You understand? But this is yeah. what they do. Yeah. They are, uh, North Philly, where we grew up, look at it now. 
them Temple students own it. Oh, they own it, yes. They are ripping right I, through I there. I recognize this is the neighborhood I grew up yes. in. Yes. When you see a white woman pushing an infant in a stroller at 2 o'clock in the morning with no lights, <laughs> you know the white folks are back. Yes. <laughs> are back. Yes. Yes, that is treading heavy. Remember, uh, they only left because we moved in. Yep. Remember? Now it's time to move so us out. So they moved out to these suburbs, right? Yeah. And then we made a big mistake. Moved out. When the yeah. white people, we moved out. No, there we right moved out. Yep. If we would have left them alone, they would have left us alone. <laughs> but once we moved out there, the white man said, well, you know what? If these Negroes love us so much, they're going to go wherever we go. We're going to go off, back. Yep. Bring Section 8 out here, and we're going to swip swap. Yeah. And that's exactly yeah. every, what About did. every 30 years that happens. That's why uh, I think the law in 1901 for adverse possession was mm-hmm. uh, was created here. Well, two reasons. Because of yellow fever right. and typhoid, yeah. which you know the great uh, Dr. That. Allen solved. Yes, because Richard Allen, mm-hmm. them, them, those pilgrims or whatever yeah. you want to call them, they were gross. Yeah. It's called but what also, it is. Yeah. they never intended for black people mm-hmm. to be near the economic centers of the major cities. Gotcha. That was just a byproduct mm. of great migration. It was a byproduct of yeah. white flight. They never intended the ghetto to be four sub-stops from City Hall mm-hmm. because it's an eyesore on the government. Yeah. So when white people tour the city, they're like, wait a minute. D.C. was the same way. Remember? Yes, yeah, all the major cities. Yeah, the hood, the hood was right there. All of them near the economic center, so yeah. we could find work. Yeah. That or where our kids go to school. Exactly. And that's one of the things I brought up. I said nobody can answer this question. I was like, where do most black, brown, and poor people, in general, where do they live? Yeah. Everybody looked at me with this: by school, work, or church. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. Mount North Philly, Mount Airy, right? Well. I'll say East Mount Airy and East yeah, Germantown because they're two different yeah. places, right? I got you. Most of the people, they live where? By their kids' elementary school, right? By Germantown High School that's now closed, right? Mm-hmm. It was sold for $100,000. Mm-hmm. We ain't going to say who did it. Right. Mm-hmm. Y'all do the research because mm-hmm. I don't, I don't want to get no who controversy. Who owns it? Do uh, we have it? No, we do not mm-hmm. have it. It's not because somebody texted me the other day and said black people just bought Germantown High School. No, sir. That's not true. No, sir. Mm-hmm. No. It was just a hundred thousand dollars I could have bought Germantown <laughs> High School. You could have, yeah. <laughs> But when I was trying to check into it, it wasn't getting back to me. Oh, wow. They blacklisted. You know, they, yeah. they, you know, them properties, they keep it. They don't want black people to own that. Yeah. Because if Germantown High School was a hundred grand, I had that. Yeah, that was we had 750000 I could have yeah. bought Germantown yeah. House. Yeah. But like, they would have never sold it They would have never sold, sold it to you. Yeah. Nope. Yeah. Because what, what you would bring. And there's a special energy in Germantown. That's why I live there. Who owns it, though? Not the person, but what community? Uh, like, was it I the Jews? Is it the Amish? Is it the German? Like, who? Is it a corporation? I'll, 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 I'll get Let back me, to that. I'm, I'm going to give you my I need to know yeah, that. Because yeah, yeah. I thought it was us. Somebody texted me and said, I said, black folks? Yeah. In fact, they said they got Germantown High School for free. I said, ah, mm, I mean, 100,000, that didn't do it for free. <laughs> but, but you see, that you see, I, I know. I used, I've been in it. Bro, I, I mean, I love, like, those schools. I love those Jesus. schools. Like, I love them too. Germantown, Bach. Yeah. I mean, I love those the castle buildings, on the right? Hill. You know what I'm saying? But it's like. But, but you say we cheap. don't own it. Wasn't we don't own it. Nope. Mm. We gave it away. Left. But listen. We gave it away, yeah, but we, we gave, don't own we it. We gave it away. Sit again, sit again. We gave it away, but we don't own it. <laughs> What you mean we gave it away? We gave it away, but we don't own it. How did we give it away? We didn't own it. it I got to tell you, I tell you, no, I be... off, off, okay, the I off the air. I'm pissed. I want, I want no problem. I could have had Germantown. I mean, I love it. I want no problem. We could have had Germantown. Yeah. You know, you can house every community organization in there and still have a school. You can have a supermarket on one floor, the school on the second floor. Oh, bro. It's that a, huge. A homeless shelter, a home money, and everything. That that. He's right. What do they want to use it for? Uh, they were talking about redeveloping it into like maybe like a grocery store, and then people were like, no. And they said something about condos. People was like, "Hell no!" Mm. And Fulton schools closed too. Okay, the yeah, condos school? will be gentrification. Yep, that's yeah. gonna be it. The condos. Will... That's a, that's the only thing it it's can a be. Setup. It smells like a setup. We, For we dirt rap. cheap. Yeah. We we go we go we go wrap. Yeah. But you just brought up. I'm still in the, I'm I'm still under somebody's thumb from nine to five. So I don't want no problem. I got you. I got you. We ain't gonna go. But I need to know that. Yeah. I need to know that. But here's the other thing. Yeah. Here's the other thing. You talked about people living near the school. If you want to know why they shut down so many schools, to support gentrification. If you want to get rid of black people, you got to get rid of the schools that teach their kids. You sure not do. why Philadelphia shut down so many kids, because I got to get you out of here. If your kids are still here, you won't move. So if I shut the school down, nope. you got to move. 23 schools. One of the biggest ways to gentrify Sad. the black community is to open up a charter school. That's how white folks are getting us out the ghettos. 
They go into a black community, they find a black person to front the school, mm -hmm. but the application is owned by a white person. You go around and say, hey, we got a new charter school that's going to help black boys. You know, we're going to have this and we're going to have that. That's crazy. Then guess what? Yeah. They hire all the new white folks to teach. The white folks move into the neighborhood around the school. Black people don't say anything. Why? Because who's going to have a problem with their child's teacher living on the same block? That's a good thing, right? But you fail to realize this is a strategy to raise the property tax value, force mm -hmm. you to sell your house. So 10 years after the charter school opened, you can't even afford to live in that neighborhood no more. Charter schools have been used in black communities to whitewash the neighborhoods. You, you wow. know, Chester yes. has wow. has two charter schools. Chester um, Community Charter. Chest, Chest, prime real estate. Chester Let's has two high. Prime Chester has oh, two charter schools oh, oh, and one high school. They closed down the uh, Catholic school, and pretty much, I think there's what maybe two other. You got Chester High. And that's it. And then it's like two or three. Two elementary other schools. elementary schools, and, and that's it. And then there's two of them one on the east side, yeah. one on the west side. Yeah. And then they. then they That whole district is going to be chartered. And it's kind of sad because, it. yeah, it's just, it. yeah. Remember now, the United States Constitution does not give you a right to learn. The word education is not in the Constitution, but it's in the Pennsylvania State Constitution. Education is a state right. Yeah, it is not a constitutional, constitutional right. right. For federal the United interest, States yeah. Department of Education was founded in 1980, 1981. Yeah. It's only, what, 40 years old, 30 yeah. years old? Yeah. And there's a lot of white folks who want to get rid of it. They say, why is my taxes paying for a service that my constitution does not require? Mm -hmm. More than half of the white people in America either don't have kids or don't send their kids to public school. And they don't want to pay public school taxes. Public school is a thing of the past. I give you 30 more years. It's over. It's going to be all charter and all independent. Yeah. And then once they charterize the entire district, they, they're going to start charging tuition. It's going to go from charter to tuition. When there's no longer a public school option, you will have to pay to go to school, which is what it used to be like before compulsory education. Mm -hmm. Go back in America's history. The churches started the schools, yeah. right? And then you had to pay a tuition to go to the church schools, and then the private schools grew up as a reaction to church control of education. Mm -hmm. You had to pay, and then compulsory ed came. Yeah. And compulsory ed came only because the factories demanded a better educated low-wage earner. We didn't get compulsory ed for kids. We got compulsory ed, so when you go work for Pepsi, you know how to read the damn signs and read the button. You, you understand yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, now high school is so you can stick <laughs> on your feet. A lot of people don't. A lot exactly. of people don't know that. Like literally, that's basically what exactly. it was for initially. Exactly. But you know, for me personally, I'm a I'm a product of public education. Me too. And I'm I, but I had some great teachers. Me too. You know, I've, but I'm that was a different kind of teacher. Yeah. This now. Yeah. My favorite teacher. I went to Mead Elementary School, 18th and Oxford. Mm. My favorite teacher was Miss Robinson, fifth grade. Miss Mack was my fourth. My white teacher in sixth grade was Miss Lube. She was good. I went to Beaver Junior High out here, uh, uh, 59th and Malvern. Uh -huh. Mr. Morlitz, just retired two years ago. Wow. White guy. Damn good teacher. Yeah. I remember all my teachers because they was good. Yeah. That ain't what you got now. Yeah, I got those. These, I got, young, uh. these young teachers, don't, you see how they dress? Mm. They will go into class like they go into the club. To the club. Breast out, mini skirt. And guess why they can do that? Because there's no dress code in public education. I ain't gonna lie, Yo, I, I might have paid more attention to class though. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I tell teachers all the time. The reason why he fell in that class, the reason why he fell in that class yeah, is because he's watching that ass. Yeah, he sure <laughs> enough is. You know. I don't know, because uh, Miss uh, Miss Jackson, she would hate me for this, but Miss Jackson was fine. That was my uh, sixth and seventh grade history teacher. Did you learn anything besides her? It don't matter. I got these and these in her class. I think that's all that matters. Well, the other thing, too, the education system in America has been very dumbed down. Yeah. Okay. We're like 29th, I think, right? In, oh, yeah. In math America math. is third from the bottom of the 25 most industrialized nations education index. That's crazy. The only reason why education is so important it have to be that way either. It's a political issue. Yeah. People love it. It sounds good, right? Yeah. It makes people think you care about the kids. And there's a lot of money in education. Books. Tests. Supplies, education. Ask, ask, ask Texas. Exactly. Because you know, you know where most of our textbooks come from, right? Books. And okay. CA in Texas lead the nation for the worst outcomes for black kids too. Pennsylvania. This is like up Texas. This is North Texas. But we got, but we got to understand something. Texas was after the Emancipation Proclamation, which does, which does not mean free. Um, uh, Texas still had slave people enslaved yeah. for two extra years. Well, yeah, let me enslaved for two extra years. Also, Jersey was one of the last states in the union to give up slavery. I would never live in Jersey, bro. 
I just I can't Wait do a minute, it. Now Jersey was in the union though, but it was one of the last states. I mean, you don't gotta believe me. Just look it up. <laughs> well, it may have been one of the last union states. Yeah, but it was the border states: Delaware, Missouri, Kentucky. That still had the slaves on the Civil War. But Jersey may have been one of the last of the original. And in, in the union, to yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. And Jersey got a horrible school system. And but people, people jump, people run to Jersey, people, especially the suburbs. I always say, if you want to know how much your people respects themselves, look at how they let other people treat their kids. Mm. There's no way you're going to tell me black people are proud of who they are and we send our kids to white folks. Even bougie blacks send their kids to white folks. They'll pay for it, but they still send them to white folks. I got a problem right now. I'll give y'all some self-disclosure. My seven-year-old baby girl, right? Because you, you got two daughters, right? I got two daughters, yeah. 16 and 7. Ooh, we got to go buy guns. <laughs> girl's hot. But my baby girl, her mom got her up with friends. White, racist, Quaker, slave-owning ass school. So you got Dr. Umar baby in there with them crackers. Mm. Okay. So I have a, I got an issue going on. You got an it, I yeah. Got an issue. <laughs> I got some post-traumatic slavery to see. I thought a white got flag out. You got being educated by racists because you value white people in front of your children. Yes. Mm. That's yeah. deep. Yeah, it is, but it, it's then, true. And Sad. then we think they do a better job teaching our kids. Why? Because the test scores go up. But guess why the test scores go up? You know what test scores go up? Are they really learning anything in the test Some scores? of them are. See, here's what you got to understand. Like Those memory. kids are the children of rich white folks. They're going to run the business whether they're dumb as a doorknob. Mm -hmm. They don't have to learn nothing. Mm. You understand? I don't have to. My father is this. My mother is this. I don't have to take school. That's all I got to do is say I'm who I am. I'm the CEO job because of blood. This is family. I don't have to excel. But the reason why black kids do better at the white schools is because they're subject to a high quality of vocabulary in English. White yeah. people, they, they, they speak standard English. Mm. In the hood, you don't get that. No. So when you take the state test, you're seeing questions and words that you now understand that you didn't understand in North Philly only because of the quality of the verbal exchange. It is the language that makes the difference. Yes. Our children are scoring low for one reason. They don't understand the words and the questions. Yeah. Yeah, there's, this is why yeah. I say, my son got A's and B's, yeah. but he's below basic on the state test. Yeah. The teacher said he's the smartest kid in the class. How did he score below basic? I tell you. Your son don't understand the words being used. This is how they get our kids. It's the vocab. And this is why I have such a big problem with black parents who don't control how much TV, video game, and social network that their children consume. Because all those hours of this should have been spent doing books. Reading. They should have been reading. Yeah. And now social network to me is the greatest kryptonite mm. for academic improvement. Because hours we would spend reading Mm -hmm. is now spent on social media. On networks. social media. Hmm. The Doing nothing. The black child's working vocab is three grades beneath their current class standing. Damn. So a 12th grade black kid in the hood speaks like a 7th or 8th grader. A 7th or 8th grader got the vocabulary of a 2nd grader. And you wonder why they can't pass the test. Yeah. And the white man knows we don't make our kids read. Yeah. So all he says is, you know what? This is a real simple question. But I'm going to ask it with some very complicated words. Yeah. They could have made it real simple. Yeah. But no, I'm going to put this word and this yeah. word. And the teacher is not allowed to define the words yeah. in the questions. Yeah. This is in the instructions. You cannot help them understand the question. I'm not helping them answer it. Yeah. I'm just helping them understand what the word. Right. They can't because they depend on our child's illiteracy yeah. to truck them up on them tests. Yeah. L l I want to share something about this. So in Florida, right, where I spent a, a large part of my childhood, there was actually a test, and because my, you know, my mother's Haitian, right, so I knew what a saucer was, but there was a test question, right, and it's funny because it came up about 10 years later in an article mm. about racism in tests. Yes, yes, And I was yes. like, huh. but I was like, how can a test be racist? But I thought tests about it. Tests were started by racists. Yes. I get that part, but I'm talking about No, they but, literally started the test to justify sterilization, yeah. extermination, yeah, and IQ. who would get a gun in the front lines of World War One? Yeah, the IQ test and all that. Yeah. But yeah, the reason why I knew what a saucer was is because my mother had China, my grandmother had China, but that's how I knew. But I'm like, the average kid doesn't know what the hell is. Yeah, no, 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 no,
Yep. Hot dogs and beans, you had to pot in the yeah. fork. With the white with the white bread. With the white, <laughs> with the white, white bread. bread. Jump going in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, yeah. I'll give you a question on an old IQ test. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's on the current one, so I can okay. They, they, there's a uh, subtest we give out on the intelligence test mm-hmm. where the child has to identify what's missing from the picture. Okay. You show a, a comb with some of the teeth broken. And the question is, what's missing from the comb? Right? Mm-hmm. You're supposed to say the teeth. What if the kid doesn't But in the black house, we half don't have the teeth, teeth were missing. Oh, oh, so it was normal for us not to. L. Like, it's normal for us to I'm have that. You, they trip us up in so many ways. Mm-hmm. Like, I give the test, right? I'm 40 years old, six degrees. I don't even know some of the words. And I'm testing your kid on words I don't even know? Damn. That's yeah, crazy. damn. The tests are designed to produce a, produce a result. That was already predetermined should exist. Mm. I need y'all to understand this. There's something in testing known as standardization. Yeah. Standardization means we're going to test the test yeah. before we give it. Yeah. Well, yeah. In other words, we're going to come into Philly and we're going to test some of the kids and see how they do on these items. And then based on how they do, guess what we're going to do? We're going to put the items that they got wrong in the final version of the test. Mm-hmm. I already know how the black kid's going to do on the state PSSA because I already gave them the items last summer. The whole thing is set up. And you got people coming to play. We need our kids to do better. Yeah. Negro! <laughs> this <laughs> whole thing is set up. The whole thing is a scam. I'm telling you. You're talking about the, the, the Pennsylvania student scam say, assessment? Say, did you scam, say scam? Like that. Yeah. And now it's worse. Because you can't measure talent. Now I got the graduation test to keep some. Yeah, but you can't, you can't measure talent through a no, test. You you, no, can, you cannot. Right? Like, and I'll tell you why. Yeah. Number one, in my experience, yeah. 40% of the variance in the test huh. is due to attitude, interest, motivation, how they felt that day. Mm. On top of that, what, what, they, what if they hungry? What if they hungry? Yeah, hungry. Working vocabulary, yeah. hunger, personal problems, not being able to focus. Trauma. So if your child gets an 85, you better have a 95. Other things was going on. Other things. Children have more important things to do than learn. It sounds kind of bad to say that, but it's true. I'm no, a child. That's how that's how it is in um what I think Finland and, and Switzerland. Yeah. They have the best for young kids, like big best scores in the world right now because there's no homework. Yeah. You learn while you at school. Yeah. And you go be a kid, and there's like two hours of playtime. But I do believe in homework. Depends. I do believe in homework. You don't get better unless you practice. These schools I that don't reading. give out homework. Mm-hmm. No, you have to practice the math. You have to practice the language. You have to. These schools that don't give out homework, mm-hmm. and there's no research that shows not giving out homework is better than giving out homework. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know why they don't give out homework? Because it's easier for the teachers. Mm-hmm. One less thing I have stuff. to do. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. It's less work. Why are cyber no schools so popular now? Why everybody want to put their kid on the cyber school? No right. Ca- Leave them at home. No accountability. Learn on the computer. If I open up a cyber school, there's almost no overhead. I don't need no buildings. I don't need no lunch truck. I don't need a security guard. You, you see that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. All I need is to give everybody a laptop and put a curriculum online. Yeah, but and I don't... keep all the revenue. Yeah, but now you have no, these kids have no social skills. Yes. It's about yeah. money. Yeah. This ain't about helping no kids. Yeah. Especially ours. Exactly. Especially ours. It's kind of sad that, um, and I'm not going to lie, I grew up in the 60s um, and lived on news. But I was one of those that when I heard uh, 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 Louis Farrakhan, Malcolm X, Mm -hmm. King, white people, white people, I'm like, oh, my God, you can't say that. Like, oh, my God, we can't talk bad about them. I grew up like that. I did. No one in my family told me not to. Actually, I never shared it. But I just felt like, oh, my God, they're going to think that we don't like them. I didn't know about racism. I never experienced it. I didn't know about slavery until school like I never experienced mm-hmm. any of that like me and my grandmother we traveled when I was with my mom we was at family house so I never okay so it wasn't until I got a little older and let me start listening more and more and I was like wow okay yeah okay so now I'm adamant I don't care if I talk bad or make you feel some kind of way when I say hey we ought to be proud of our skin we are but uh I find it interesting that there are people still like me in our in our in my, in my, at my age, mm-hmm. that are still thinking we can't talk bad about white people. Yeah, but like they don't like us. Like you can't. Like you can't offend I don't them. Even call it talking bad about white people. 
talking honestly. Well, about but they consider talking bad about them. You know, yeah, because yeah. But here's the thing: we have to. And the the comment from the brother last night, right? I think part of it is we have to stop, especially when it's a predominantly black space. We have to stop going out of our way to make white people comfortable in black oh spaces. And, uh, yes, oh and that's how... That's, you have the whole Yeah, that's, that's it. That's oh pretty much gosh. it. You, yeah. have, you have everything else. Which is you why have, yeah. we should not allow... This is why I believe white people uh. have no place in black organizations mm. or black meetings mm. for two reasons. Number one, they change the energy of the whole room because every black person in that room knows that that white person has more power than they do. Mm. You understand? It changes the dynamic. You automatically start watching what you say. Yeah. You watch how you behave because you know that they are a representative of the power structure. Yeah. And even if they have no power themselves, they can pick up the phone yeah. and make a phone call and mess your whole damn life up. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, so whenever there's one white person in a black organization, it throws it off. Yeah. And if you notice when the white people come amongst us, they don't come to just be a member. They always assume a leadership role, do they not? Show me a black organization with a white person who is not in some sort of leadership role, financial role, influential role, legal advisor, steering committee. They are never just a regular member. Mm -hmm. They have to play the white mommy and the white daddy. And that's why they should not be there. Because there's not a white person on earth, not one, mm -hmm. who is ever going to jeopardize their own white privilege mm -hmm. that they exercise as a result of your oppression they're never going to destroy that white privilege so they can be treated as an equal with you. White people will do some good things, mm -hmm. but they will never do the right thing. And mm -hmm. the right thing is to destroy white privilege and white race, and they will never touch it. You cannot name a white person who has ever fought to eliminate white privilege. But I mean, never. But anything, think about it. When you, when you have been flying in a helicopter all your life, right? Now you probably got to fly, fly in a, I don't know, a hang glider. Sure. But everybody has a hang glider. It doesn't seem fair. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Equality or the illusion of equality. equality is a sin yeah. for white folks. Mm. Mm. Equality is a sin. Mm. See, three things black people need to know. This is why we'll never get equality. Yeah. You can get it, but you got to fight to keep it. Yeah. Number one, white genetic survival. Mm. What is the number one reason why we had segregation in the first place? To keep the black man's fathers out of the white woman's vagina. Because anything the black man touches produces a black child. Anything the black woman touches, we are the only people on earth who have 100% reproductive privilege. Mm. Whether you have a baby with a white man, Chinese man, Mexican, Arab, Latino, East Indian, that baby coming out yours. Whether you have a baby with a white woman, Jewish woman, Chinese woman, Arab woman, that baby coming out looking just like you. Yeah. Right? Let's take Cardi B. She talked about how she not black, right? But she got a beautiful newborn baby by offset. That baby all Negro, 100% African, <laughs> ain't nothing Dominican about that baby. That's us. And that's why they hate us. Because you laying with the white woman increase your numbers. You don't increase theirs. And what's going on in America right now? What, what, what's going on with America right now? Did y'all read the Associated Press story? 25 of the 50 states have zero population growth for white people. That's why the police killing us like that. That's mm. why they locking us up like that. Because they can't reproduce. We can. And they like to make the black woman feel shameful about having a lot of babies because they can't. Why did George Washington rape so many black women on the plantation? Because Martha couldn't hold no babies. Why did Thomas Jefferson sexually molest little black girl Sally Hemings? Because his wife kept miscarriaging. Read the stories of America's founding fathers and you will see how they women cannot keep them babies. That's why they take them drugs, fertility pills. They be having 25 big head white babies all at the same time. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Let me, let me. <laughs> Dr. Umar, uh, let me stop laughing. This is Dr. Umar. You know I'm telling the truth. You saw them babies come out. It I was see. 15. Uh, it was 15 big uh, head. My, my, my face is not on this. <laughs> let, let, me, let me ask you this. Sure. I'm not sure if you know, if you heard of the, uh, uh, what is it, blue... Blue eyes, brown eyes, exercise. Uh, that Jane, was Jane that Elliott. was Jane Elliott. Yeah. Oh, Jane Elliott. Yeah. Mrs. Uh, white racism destroyer. I like I, I like her, man. I like her, bro. I like her. But well, y'all missing the point. Uh, yeah. Up. Her and Tim Watts. Okay. This is a career for them. Okay. 
They will never see. Don't talk about it. Mm. What has Jane Elliott or Tim Wise done to actually work mm. to eliminate white privilege in America? Well, she's made white women cry. And you know when you do that, you're going to lose the job. That's not Preachers the same. Preachers make you cry in church. <laughs> what have they done? That's fair. You see what I'm saying? Touché. It is fair. It is fair. See, see, see we got to separate the rhetoric from the work. So, for example, we here, we talking, right? Yeah, absolutely. I'm telling you how they mess with our kids, right? Yeah. But I have a school I'm building. There's work with my with, rhetoric. With your, yeah. You see, I mm-hmm. got the national independent. There's work with my rhetoric. There's work with your rhetoric. Yeah. There's work with yeah. Jane Elliott and Tim Wise. I mean, we can't afford not to do something. Exactly. Because we're, we're held to a different standard. Exactly. Right? But see, when black people hear white people crucify racism, we put them in a special place. Mm. They also benefit from white privilege. Of course. Remember Michael, who was the movie producer? Michael Moore? Bowling for Columbine, yeah, yeah, yeah. Michael. Uh, uh, not, uh, Michael Moore. Is it Moore? Yeah, Michael Moore. Remember? Yeah, he, the white. Yeah, remember he was Mr. Liberal, right? Mm-hmm. But remember he got cornered about Mamiya. What did he say? He said Mamiya was guilty. That's right. Get them liberals in the corner and push them on a real black issue, and you will see the cracker come right out. They mm. not on your side. Cracker. <laughs> but here's the thing. So, Caucasian. Excuse me. So it's Neanderthal. <laughs> what you want me to say? <laughs> Shot. Shot. I now, um, look. I need you so, to be about as real as real. Cause right. why be fake? So that whole so that whole situation. Yeah. That's not you. Y'all, cause That's, they don't do anything to, to eliminate the privilege. Yeah. Tim Wise, I respect them. Yeah. Jane Elliott, I respect you. At least black people will listen to them when they say racism exists. Yeah. Yes. You, Cause they're not gonna listen to me and you. But when they hear a white person say we racist, yes. they believe them. So there's a benefit. But what I'm saying is, With it's only skin deep. Right. They're not doing anything to systematically eliminate racism, bias, inequity, and white privilege in this country. And they never will. They will only talk about it. The white liberal is the biggest racist of them all. Because they will come to the black community, tell you what's wrong with white people, and run right to the suburbs before it get dark. <laughs> <laughs> to their house with those same white folks. Yeah, That's true. I, I've, I've, I do. I think about it a lot. You know, because you do have the white people that speak up for us. But when it's, as we put it, when the shit hit the fan... Oh, Listen, it's like okay, listen, I need either you gonna be on us. They wanna talk for- black. They wanna be in Black Panther. They wanna everybody wanna be black till it's time till it's to time. face injustice. And then, yeah. and then as soon as yeah. the police start killing, they disappear. All the liberals go. Yeah, that reminds me of um well I can't say it on the air, but um uh, Earth Gang. I've been Earth Gang. Uh, Earth Gang. Um uh, dang. I can't remember the name of the song. But basically, he says, you know, everybody wants to be an N word until it's yeah. time to be an N word. Yes. Yeah. He's like, yes. white people like they that's my. Rap, yep. wear your clothes, Chinese date like that's my. Listen to your yeah. music, drive your cars, big rims. But soon the cops start killing black folks. I'm a crack. <laughs> <laughs> I am not one of them. I, no. I'm there was actually some jokes around that with. Um, did you? So there was this video on Facebook that one of my young boys sent me about like these Chinese dudes that were making their hair like. Oh like, yeah, right. yeah. yeah. And, I uh, watched that. Like, he said, "Watch when he get pulled over. He gonna be talking about us <laughs> being <laughs> me <laughs> from Korea." <laughs> yeah, so, uh, I watched that. If I had a child who thought white people weren't racist and their white friend was okay, I would let them hang with them. Because guess what? There's no better way to teach a black child that white people racist than to let them experience it. It's going to hurt them. It's going to crush their heart. Yeah. But at least they will learn the lesson. Well, yeah. You see what I'm saying? At least they will learn the lesson. As long as it's not going to put them in any personal harm. Yeah. But just for my daughter to see that that white girl didn't genuinely care about you, when you went to her house and her parents said they couldn't find a wallet and she asked you, did you see it? <laughs> yeah. I'm saying this didn't happen, but oh, this okay. is what happens, saying, though. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Did you see uh, the hate you give? I never, I have not the seen movie? it. Wow. Yeah. The hate you give, you must see it. Okay. Yeah, I was told you need you to. You must see it. Oh, wow. Okay. And yeah. I, I still good. haven't seen the other movie, the Get Out. What is that? Get Out. Get Out. out. With us. Some of that. Is that the new, the new the new one? Get Out was last year. Yeah. The new one is Us. That's in yeah. the movie. Yeah. But I was like, I, I mean, from I thought Get Out was better than Us, though. I like. Get I out didn't better. see Us, us but I saw better. Get Out. Get Out was better too. Me. Yeah. Okay. I like. Lo- yeah. It, it it you really had me like whoa. And his friend, his best friend, t- was trying to tell him, but he didn't want to listen. I, mean, I lived there every day. I mean, I'm a straight black man. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. This, this, know. this, this is, is another reason why I don't know. You look kind of past. Yeah. You can't take 
a break from being black. No. no. The whites can. You see what I'm yeah. saying? They can come party in the hood, throw that suit on, mm-hmm. and run their ass up. You can run right back. You see what I'm saying? I can't do this. Like, we, this we, is we me can. all day. So why do you let them approximate your culture like that yeah. when it's just an act and a costume? And then they go home and be full-time white kids. But you ain't. You can't take no break. You always black. I'm always so why black. You allow them to approximate your culture like that. Mm. It's a disrespect to every black person that ever lived. Mm. I don't hate white folks, but I know you racist. Mm. I don't hate snakes, but I know they bite. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you, you know what I, I was I was trying to say earlier is kind it's kind of because uh, damn I forgot how I met Pat. It, oh, was that a, it was at it was at a, it was at an event. But anyway, I had a forum here, and it was the lack of black love in the hood. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah and I, I, what happened was there was I was being uh, tagged or shared in a lot of fights that was going on within our black community, pants hanging and everything. And I'm like, wow, that's a disgrace. Like seriously, this is how we act. So uh, I th- I thought about immediately, you know. Um, Black man, of course, you come out of jail. I get it. Baby mama drama. She want her money. Like, I just got out the door. Like, literally, I, just, I got the P.O. off my behind if I don't get a job. I don't condone and selling drugs. And I, yeah, and I, and I don't condone selling drugs. But, okay, I got to shut her up. The judge tell you, you better show up Friday with two grand. Two. I just got out of jail Monday. Yeah. You telling me to have two grand by Friday? Yeah. Now, you and I know it's only one way to get two grand by <laughs> Friday. Right. You follow me? Yeah. So the judges are literally telling you to break the law. Yeah. But they're just not saying they're just not it. They're just not saying it. If he tell you you got to have two grand by Friday, five days, there's only one way I'm going to get that. Yeah. Yep. I got to sell or I got to stick somebody up. Oh. Yeah. And it's a shame that they put us in those situations. It That's is. I hate child support but we, and we did. I hate family court. Yeah. That ain't nothing but the damn slave auction. Yeah. We letting white folks dictate what's best for our kids. I mean, if you lay down the makeup, why you can't stand up to take care of them? Yeah. It's sick. And yeah. that line be long as hell. It's just like the slave auction block. Now, I pay child support. I'll be scared to go down there because everybody knows that I got the hoodie up. They say, not can I get a picture? Not in here. Put that damn phone. Put the phone down. You can't get no picture. We a family caught my dude. But here's the problem with that, though. A lot of people don't know that, you know, 15 to 20 percent of the proceeds go to the court. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. so you're so you're literally, you're literally taking money out yes. of your own children's yeah. mouth. Yes. So I actually have females who I've dated, who I've talked to, who have kids and like, oh, well, he's only giving me four hundred dollars. What? I'm like, did you not hear what I said when I was taking care of my sister's three kids? And I ain't get no money. That's right. That's I right. get no money from their dads. Yeah, you know right. what I'm saying? But I happily took care of them because that's how I was raised. Right. You said men are here to protect, provide, right? Yep. Even though they're not my kids and I ain't had no fun making them. You will be blessed for that. Because, yep. because of the situation yeah. and the circumstances, yeah. if I'm here, and here's my thing, and you know, people could take this however they want. If you're in a position where you can help and you don't help, you're just as bad as the people that yep, hurt you. Yep, sure. Period. Absolutely. Like, we are obligated as, Absolutely. as, as men, as people, to step in when we can. Trust me, you That's can't save everybody. We are, but we've gotten away from it. Okay. Service has been transformed into selfishness. Mm. We are a selfish as people. Do you know that black people are at the bottom of the list to adopt and foster parent black children? Mm. We are the last people likely to adopt and foster our own kids. Yes. All these black kids in the Philadelphia foster care system, they're more likely to be adopted by somebody other than a black person. Yes, we at the bottom. Of, but it seems like we're in the bottom because they make it very difficult for us to adopt. Mm-hmm. I know people wanted to adopt and foster. You know what they tell them? Well, you got locked up for marijuana at fifteen. Some of these little kids, some of these little kids, bad as hell, bro. I don't know. Stop! Well, Stop! I put, I put hands on people's kids. <laughs> right, if we I'm from that era. Them, I'm from that who, era. Well, yeah, yeah. If we don't take them. Yeah. They'll be the ones out there killing grandma. Yeah. Right. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Because right. you say to yourself, how could a fifteen year old blow out another person's? Yeah. Mm. No remorse. Yeah, if you never felt love, yeah. how do you get you it? Give it. Yeah. If you never felt, you say, that woman took that man kid from him, never let him see his child. Well, in her house, that's how the father treated the mother. She never saw what respect for the opposite gender looked like. A lot of these kids that show this intense hate and lack of remorse, they never saw love, man. Yeah. We got a whole generation of black kids who don't know what love is, but they know what pain is. They know what hate is. And they know what revenge is. Mm. And if we don't get them in check, they're going to end up killing us. They will purge us. 
We don't have to worry about the white people. Nope. These crazy black kids will purge us themselves because mm. they are literally out of their minds. They are. They are. <laughs> but but real fast, we, we talked about uh, the lack of black love in the, in the hood. And only I did that because there was a young lady in Florida um, year, uh, a few years ago. Apparently, it was a big stink because the, she had mental issues. And the police, uh, she had her daughter in her hand, and the police had shot and killed her while she had her baby in her hand. Philly did a little peace march, and I missed it. Um, and it was supposed to end at the no Philadelphia Library. No so I go, I, I missed no the... No more marching. Well, it was a, it was a, like, Philadelphia did their march because okay. of the lady, but they I were to meet up. I get it, yeah, they was going to meet up at the library, the and I get to the point. library, yeah. and I ask the question, where are the men? Because I noticed that some of these protests, these things, it's the ladies mm -hmm. when it used to that's be the true. men. That's so true. that's why I asked, where are the black men? I get it. We were here. In jail or we were <laughs> to pay child support. But not all black men are in jail and not all black men are That's working. True. So even That's when true. you are working, why is it these ladies get off from work and we're we're I arm agree. to arm protesting we the laws of the way we, right. the shouldn't have to front You shouldn't. It's supposed yeah. to be the men, the women, and then the children. You know, and that was it. But then I also did a follow up with the ladies and it was are we bitter? Are we just misunderstood. And I asked that question because I literally was walking on 15th Street going in town, and I watched the white lady on her phone. And as I was getting near her, she was on the phone pissed, but she was quiet with her pissed. Two blocks later, I see Rashima on the phone, and all I heard from two blocks away, so I figured if I turn around and look, she shut up. I'm still listening to her, and I'm trying to figure out, are we, were we just, are we just bitter? And that's what they came in. So I had uh, State Rep uh, Morgan Cephas come on and another lady come on. And of course, you know, the vibe was a little different, but mm -hmm. why is it that we are such a undivided, unlike, group of and I look at slavery and it's like okay y'all made us like we didn't do like we didn't say hey you know make us slaves but why is it no one likes us to the point where three reasons uh -oh. I gave you one <laughs> your genetic superiority they hate you for that everybody hates you for that because if you touch their women you make more black kids they hate you for that you're the only people in the world who have that that's number one number two your historical accomplishments Look at what we have done. We're the oldest people. We're the greatest people. We built things that the world still can't even figure out how we mm. did. The Chinese and Japanese tried to do a pyramid. Did you know that? They kept messing it up. And they, tried to, they said, we can recreate the pyramid. Yes. You didn't hear, read about this. Yes, the Chinese and the Japanese, the smart people, tried to do the pyramids in Kemet and could not do it. They gave up and said, this we can't do it. Yes. Not only that, look at our inventions. We invented this. Cell phone. Internet. Helicopter. Yeah, brother, yeah. A, 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 yeah. Lot of chip. a lot of people don't know that. Why Thanks for saying that. Yeah. Because Lewis Latimer wrote that text. Mm -hmm. How to light up the city. At street night. light. The, the they know the street. <laughs> left alone without racism, you would rule the world again. See, here is the hypocrisy of racism. The hypocrisy of racism is if you are so superior to me, why do you have to systematically disadvantage me if you're going to win anyway? You see that? Mm -hmm. If you are greater than me, the white man is superior to the black man. Why do you have to systematically disadvantage the black man if you're superior? Yeah. You should be able to give me a head start and still win. The truth of the matter is white supremacy is really white inferiority. Mm -hmm. White supremacy is really white inferiority and white insecurity. Mm -hmm. That's why white women naturally crave the black man sexually. You go into a room full of white girls, they will crave you because you're the original man. The melanin, the DNA, the universe speaks to that white girl through you. She's not full because she's pale. She ain't got this. We're the only complete human beings. Everybody else is a hybrid and an android. The Chinese are androids. The Mexicans are androids. The Europeans are hybrids. We're the only full one. So a woman that reproduces life on a subconscious level is going to want to reproduce full bred children. That's Africans. The white woman don't even know why she likes you. She can hate black people and still be attracted to that black man. That's why you see a lot of racist white women married to these black men. But mm. she doesn't even like black folks because of something about his melanin that speaks to her because she's not complete without it. Mm. 
And that's why the white men get real insecure when we're around their women because they can feel their women wanting us. And some brothers mistake that for sexual performance. It ain't got nothing to do with sexual mm. performance. It has to do with genetic significance. We are the gods and goddesses. What the Bible says, and you shall know that you are gods. That's, a, that's another Jerry episode. Because that, that was the but stereotype. You're not going to that in public school. No. There's no way in hell you're going to turn a black boy into a god and a black girl into a goddess in Philadelphia public schools because you pledge an allegiance. 180 days a year for 12 years. I'll pledge allegiance. To the flag. 180 days after 12 years, by the time you get out, you a Negro. Ain't no God in there. Negro. Mm. So the first mm. thing we got to do is get our kids out from schools. It will never be a hope. You cannot let your enemy educate your kids and think you're going to get liberated. Do you know the best time to mold the mind is birth to 12? Yeah. And guess why our kids be at birth to 12? With Miss Silverberger and Slurmanowski. <laughs> okay. I'm going to pop them. Okay. White women got our kids. But I mean, it, even though I'm, we're laughing, that is the, the truth. truth. It is the truth. It's the truth. Yeah, yeah, it's, there's some validity to what you're saying. You, know, you don't yeah. see the white people leaving their kids with black people all mm -hmm. day long. But there's no. some validity to what you're saying about completion. Well, except if it's the nanny. But, um, <laughs> and it's usually a Caribbean person. <laughs> but, um, no shade. <laughs> um, so they. <laughs> So there's some validity what you're saying. Uh, I learned this from Dr. Dedisi. I know his name. Yeah, so Dr. Dedisi was, uh, was a Buffalo soldier. Ah. Mm. Um, mm. Uh, power, rest in power to the ancestors. All right. I, only, I didn't know him for a very long time, but I, um, in the short time I know, we used to text every day. Wow. I, I miss him so much. A Buffalo soldier. He was a Buffalo soldier. He was a real one. He's a real one. He's a real wow. One. He's a real one. Um, actually, shout out to the, um, the, Federation of National, uh, the National Federation of Black Veterans. Out wow. in Germantown, I appreciate those old heads. Every time I, I'm, I'm, with, I'm always in the room with at least 100, two, three hundred years of experience. Easy, man, man. Um, and they always pour in, They always pour into it me. It is. They always pour into me. But yeah, Doctor DC used to come. I think he lives all the way in out in L.A. and he was like wow. a sheriff for like 30 years. Woo. Yeah, so he he survived a lot, and uh, he always used to tell me like, yeah, he's like, you are complete, and I'm like, what are you saying? Like, what do you mean by that? And he was like, you know, I really appreciate the fact that you were an Afro. I'm like, why do you say that? He was like. Pluck, he's like, pluck on the hair. He's like, oh my God. So he plucked the hair out of my head. He said, look at this. This is a, and he pulled it. And he was like, that's a number nine. Mm. Nine is completion. Mm. It's a divine number. I'm like, dang. Yeah. <laughs> just, just that little bit, right? Yeah. Punched me right inside of my head. So I had to go look, you know, I did the research. So to your point about, you know, but I really think that when we both work in conjunction with the sisters, that's that's when we find God. That's my, that's my personal Absolutely. opinion. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> because... Our divinity partly lies in our connection to the opposite gender. Yep. Okay. We are a reflection and a manifestation of supreme consciousness, but supreme consciousness fixed us in a way to need that other side. Yeah. God is complete, but we are not yet complete till we have that opposite person. So like in African culture, you're not even considered a human being until you marry because right. you need that other side of you. Mm. You're not considered a man until you take wife. Mm. In many cultures, wow. you see. And spiritually, you're not considered whole without your woman because you need her to ground you, and she needs you to ground her. Mm. Which is why in African culture, even in a patrilineal society where the men rule, there's still a queen mother that rules over the king. That old woman sitting next to Shaka Zulu, that's the queen mother. Guess what her job is? Her job as the manifestation of feminine energy is to make sure the masculine energy stays in balance with the feminine. Yeah. So if the king makes a decision that is out of alignment with the people, meaning it's not masculine and feminine together, the queen mother can override the king. Hmm. The king is not the be all and end all. The queen mother has the right to unseat him. <clears throat> there is no masculine without the feminine. That's why when you see African art, you see the big strong king, and behind him, you normally see some wings mm -hmm. or some feathers or some breasts. That's letting you know that his authority lies in the fact that he's harmonizing his masculinity with femininity. Mm -hmm. The divine is the balance of masculine and feminine, which is a whole nother conversation on if that's the case, what about same sex, same sex couples? Next! <laughs> no, comment, no comment. No comment. We're going to make next week on this one. <laughs> 
<laughs> Listen, yeah. gay people have the right to be just as miserable as the rest of us. You want to get married? <laughs> you can get married. Yes. But, 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 uh oh. I'm just kidding. From a community perspective, I got you. And I love all black folks. <laughs> but we do have to have a conversation on what is in our best interest as a people yeah. and not. We've always had that behavior around us, right? It's nothing new. Sure. But it was never promoted sure. as a positive option for our children. And it was never indoctrinated in elementary school. Mm. That's where we take the issue at. Yeah. If you into that, you into that. Yeah. But who told you to come out the room with it and start giving it to the grandkids? That's the issue. That yeah, we yeah, because you're imposing your will on them. Yeah, yeah that's, not, that's not fair. When yeah. you grew up, you only had one path. That's when she grew up, she had one path. Yeah. My daughters, I got to have conversations with them. Because they got six, seven, eight, nine paths now. Yeah. You could be this, you could be this, you could be this, you could be this and this. Especially when they go to You could be high. this. This, you got 12 choices. Ain't that so? <laughs> Was it? I won't get y'all in trouble. Okay. Okay, you're ending it. Okay. Okay. Man, so this is, uh,